Yeah, yeah. 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 August 10th, 8.35 a.m. I'd like to call the Oxford Bridge Port Authority board meeting uh, officially in order. Uh, I think really what we need to do is, um, it's been a long time since I had a distinguished group of people serving our board as, as we have today. And, and so I'm really grateful that uh, people that our new board members uh, came on board, volunteer their, their extra time, valuable time, to serve this, this Port Authority. Uh, we are in a very, very complex, exciting time for the Bridge and Port Authority and, and having some great people come. I'm a member of the uh, St. Lawrence County Public Defender's Office. Some of you may have met me in some other capacity, but I'm a new member of the board, uh, and uh, just happy to be doing my part to help out Augensburg in the North Country. I'm Megan Witten. I'm an attorney at Lexington Hills and Fiat Patton. I'm from Governor. I'm very happy to be here and to meet all of you today. I'm Patrick Sharrow, the airport manager here for Augensburg, kind of overseeing the expansion of the airport and look forward to working with all of you guys and working with the communities to make this a thriving community and bring some more air travel to the, to the North Country. Uh, Frank Capello, attorney for the board since 2007.
thanks for being here this morning, gentlemen. Okay, I think uh, we're going to wait here a little bit. Wait, do we have any letters of communication to the board? Uh, we do. We have several things. A thank you from the lieutenant governor for the tour. Um, our outreach to Congresswoman Stefanik's office regarding the um, vessel incidental discharge. We have documentation, um, which is very fortunate from the Canadian Pilots Association that demonstrates a safety issue at the port. Um, this was in advance of the um, accident that occurred at the port where the ship hit the wall, and it will all but guarantee that uh, our project will be expedited with the Army Corps of Engineers. There's a note in there for, from the um, St. Lawrence uh, uh, County IDA regarding the non-support by River Valley Redevelopment Authority of our airport uh, initiative. set up here, um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm what we call internally the Brown Johnson, the facility manager for, for the Augensburg Airport. So my role is to sort of coordinate all the activities that we're involved in at the airport. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of construction going on. But uh, a big part of what we wanted to do with this presentation, and again, it'll be brief, is kind of, there's a lot of new faces in the room. We kind of want to bring everybody up to speed and give you a quick introduction to us and kind of uh, give you a real brief uh, roadmap of how we got to where we are today. With that, some of this will be uh, old material for, for the folks that have been around a while. So we'll do, I'll give you a quick introduction to McFarland Johnson. We'll talk a little bit about Airport Funding 101 because it is kind of a complex and competitive world that, that funds all these projects. Uh, we'll talk about the passenger facility charge, which is another mechanism of funding airport projects. We'll talk about how we got to where we are, and then uh, Bill will give you a um, Review of uh, where we are exactly with construction and the budget. So, McFarland Johnson was founded in 1946, 70 years ago, uh, this past April, which is pretty exciting. We have nine offices. We're anticipating opening a few more. We're roughly 110 employees. It changes uh, throughout the year as we bring out single staff for construction, inspection, and whatnot. Um, if you look, you can't really see it, but we do have an office in Key West. There's a little logo there at the bottom of Florida. It's the one office I haven't made it to yet, but I'm making it my goal to get there this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe go now, but February would be nice. So, uh, uh, there's a lot of things happening there, okay, so um, we are 100% employee owned. And so what that means is all of our employees have, have stock in the company. It's really it's a uh, retirement plan for us. The company buys a stock back from us when we retire. So we have a very vested interest 
in being successful and having uh, long-term relationships with our clients. And, and we've been good at doing that. We have clients that have been with us almost from the very beginning. Um, so it's very important to all of our employees uh, that we do a great job for you and they hire us again and again and again. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great motivator because every single employee from the receptionist to the entry-level CAD operator to the CEO have a, a, a personal investment interest in making sure the company does a great work. And we take that very, very seriously. One of the neat things about our employee ownership program is that my share of stock has the same value power, whatever, as a share of the CEO has, so we're all sort of on a level playing field from that perspective. We take our core values very seriously. Um, we went through an effort probably 10 years ago or more now um, to really take a hard look at our core values. What is the problem talks about? Where do we want to go? And we came up with these, these six items. You'll see these signs throughout our offices hanging in people's uh, cubicles. We live them, we breathe them. We're about innovation and sustainability, both from an environmental perspective, from a company perspective, client service, employee engagement. We want to be one company. We are one company. Uh, we want to be entrepreneurial. We live this, we breathe this. This is our creed that keeps us going every day. So, Jeff, do you have, uh, for engineering, is there <coughs> reciprocity in engineering degrees from state to state? I know you're, is there certification requirements for each state? You have to get licensed in each state. Each state. topic for um, you know five or six or seven years ago, I guess. So that's a little bit about McFarland Johnson. I want to talk about funding. Uh, you know, some of this is again a repeat, but you know, most of the airport work is funded through the FAA for the program. As the program sits today, the FAA pays about 90, pays 95 percent of uh, uh, projects that get approved. The state pays two and a half percent and the Grid Port Authority pays the other 2.5%. The 2.5% can come from the passenger facility charge, which I'll talk, to, talk about in a minute. There's two basic uh, funding mechanisms under under Airport Cooper Program, or AIP. One is discretionary, and that's where you're competing nationally for funding. So you're competing with JFK, you're competing with uh, Los Angeles, you're competing with Chicago, you're competing with Syracuse. Um, all but uh, $300,000 of the runway project uh, came from discretionary. Quite a feat to uh, land them on like the seventeen million dollars or so that we built this project. Uh, a lot of work we're getting that done. Then there's another portion called entitlements. Currently, you're getting one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in entitlements, and that'll be true um, uh, through twenty seventeen. Once you get to ten thousand employments, which we're just paying what happened in this calendar year, your entitlements will go to a million dollars a year. So you'll start seeing that.
but it's easier it is related to safety I assume. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Pretty much the only thing it can be used for is something that generates revenue. Yeah, there, there, there are there's some photos. About 500 page book on what's uh, on the rules of the game, so to speak. But yeah, they don't like revenue. They won't fund revenue. Uh, revenue, fund, fund, uh, revenue generated costs. But you could use it to save cost. I uh, for operational I mean, things. Operational things. That, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we're effective ways of doing things. things. Great example. Yeah. If you wanted to increase the size of the terminal. Within limits, yes. They, they, Certain can, limits. they can use AIP to fund uh, public space. They can't use AIP to fund uh, any space in the terminal that will generate revenue. So mm -hmm. if you're going to charge. had a need for a hangar um, and you had a list and somebody wanted to get in there, that would just say they would have a, a very good chance of getting funded. We've done we've been successful getting funding for lots of food projects and hangers for what's called the list And that program would we anticipate will be announced before the end of the summer for the So something you want to think about. Um, and the last mechanism is the passenger facility charge. That's now a four dollar and fifty cent charge that uh, the airlines will charge people who buy tickets to fly out of Augsburg. Jeff, I want to comment on that for just a moment on the passenger facility charge because uh, I apologize. There's been a bunch of things I've been doing and one of them has not been uh, providing a compliment to a member of your staff and that's Zach's staff. Now Zach originally is the one in combination with Rick Lucas that identified that we weren't charging PFCs. We started charging PFCs three dollars and fifty cents and then it was updated to four dollars and fifty cents and all the Legion tickets should have been sold with that four dollar and fifty cent charge now we're distracted with a lot of different things going on here with construction projects with the port and everything else now Zach took it upon himself to check and make sure that the Legion was charging that four dollars and fifty cents and they weren't not only that he interfaced with the FAA got him to update their website Allegiant was being Allegiant. I won't editorialize there, but they were looking for the best possible deal for their passenger. And when they had the opportunity to do the right thing versus the not so easy thing, yes, not so easy <laughs> thing, um, they chose to not charge the fare. Now we would have lost that for months and months until we eventually caught it. Now that was a direct reflection on the quality of your staff and particularly uh, Zach. And I will be sending in a letter uh, to both you as his supervisor and the next level supervisor um, expressing the, the authority's appreciation because that would have meant major dollars that the authority would have missed. And as we learned the hard way once before, you cannot recoup them once they're missed. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. So now we are they are collected. Yes, four dollars and fifty cents. Okay. I was going to get to that in a minute, but yeah, I think we missed. I want to bring that. Yeah, I want to bring I, that I right front and center. We, we still have not received the first check from Allegiance, yeah. and uh, that's when we would have done it. When we got our first check from, we still haven't got one. I think there was a six or seven day gap. Okay, so let's see. It'll be interesting to see what they report. Send them a gift card to Whitney's. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, with the passenger facility charge, uh, you can use that to pay for the local share. As I mentioned, of uh, AIP funded projects. You can use that to pay for other projects that are AIP eligible that the FAA may not want to fund. Uh, as an example, we did an apron construction project at Binghamton. The FAA didn't have the money to do the whole thing, so therefore, come to get these new facility charges. More than 10 what? tickets, maybe? I would, hope, <laughs> I, I would hope it's in the thousands. <laughs> well, no. Well, well we should be able to determine that with the first right. check. Right. right. The first check will be broken down at, you know, X at okay. 350 and Y at 450. Well, I guess to go back to Zach, I mean, I, I know he's done it before. I can find all of the, you know, take care of it. It's probably a couple thousand dollars. Oh, right. Because yeah. did, they did collect the three three dollars. They didn't collect their two dollars. They sold a thousand tickets. Then. Oh, so what you're saying is they, they did collect the three dollars. Three dollars. Yeah. Oh, I thought they were at zero. Okay. That's great. Right. Right. So, so depending on what they reported, there oh, may not okay. be enough money to make an issue. Yeah. So that's we'll have to see. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? So that PFC, the final approval session, should all be in place for anticipating August 20th. They have a 30 days to. The FAA has 30 days to approve those applications, and typically what happens is on the 29th or 30th day. So this is the projects including the PFC, too. I think we've shown this to you before. But again, the runway, the local share of the runway extension, almost $500,000 is in there. And also the administrative cost for the PFC program can also be So, how do we get to where we are today? It started with wanting to go from the airplane on the left to the airplane on the right uh, at this airport. So you went from an eight passenger assessment to a 177 seat Airbus A320. I think um, 
I'm sure you've seen the Cape Air aircraft. I think people are going to be shocked when they see the size of that 8320 sit next to the terminal when it shows up. I can't wait to see it. But that presents some huge challenges for the airport as it was in, uh, in as it's in moving forward. This is what the project, well, this drawing is slightly out of date, but this is what the project involved. So we had a 1,200-foot runway extension to provide adequate runway length for the A320. Uh, to do that, to provide safety areas, uh, Route 68 had to be relocated. Um, terminal had to be expanded, parking had to be provided, uh, taxiway had to be extended and strengthened. The apron had to be reconstructed so it could, it could accommodate the weight of the, of the A320. Um, so it's basically a, a reconstruction of almost the entire airfield with the exception of the piece of the runway that was there. So you did, uh, you know, in one project you rebuilt the entire airfield. That's unheard of in today's model. Right? And you've got the apron and the parking and the terminal. So that's a lot. And this is a constrained site. If you have questions about why things look the way they look, it's because there are so many constraints here. The, the groundwater is shallow. Um, wetlands all over the place, uh, which were a constraint and a big cost driver and a regulatory driver. Uh, you've got the roads, obviously. So there's a lot of stuff going on there shoved into a pretty small future in uh, constraint space. So things look a little odd to you as, as they're coming to life out there. There's reasons why they look the way they do. Uh, it's not just because we're dumb. Just a quick comment. <laughs> <laughs> just a quick comment on that. This is a typical project you would see done in a 10-year time horizon. We've collapsed it down to a, a little over three by time uh, October rolls from. And this is not just unique in New York State or the Northeast. This is unique in the U.S. These projects don't happen uh, on, this, uh, on this schedule. Um, one of the most insulting things I think we accidentally said to FAA in a public session, we complimented them on the, their ability to move at the speed of business. They didn't like that because there's a process, a policy, and procedure associated with everything. But this, the beauty of this runway project, it's not a Republican or a Democratic or an independent runway, it's a runway. All our elected officials are pulled in the same way. We are able to establish a relationship with FAA and with their support, get these things done and just keep blowing through roadblock after roadblock that I'm sure you're about just presentation. And I promise you I did not share this with Wade ahead of time, but he's jumping ahead. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's so there was a lot of challenges. Uh, we started off with, you know, there was a master plan underway that didn't really contemplate somebody like the Legion showing up. And so getting the FAA as a first step before they can consider anything else, getting them to buy into the concept that Allegiant was coming with the amount of frequency they were talking about. And the FAA was looking for commitments. They wanted a letter from Allegiant saying, we're showing up on October 5th, 2016 with an A320. We're going to do four departures a day. This was three years ago. No airline's going to write that letter. But that's the level of certainty FAA was, was looking for before they would embark on this, uh, this journey that we're on right now. There's a lot of back and forth about that. The planning documents all had to be, um, had to be updated to reflect a huge change in the design aircraft.
did the, uh, the approach flight check and then through uh, July 29th. And that was, of all the milestones uh, going back to the beginning, that was one that probably concerned me the most. So uh, that was huge. Just the timing of everything. Uh, obviously, weather is a concern when you're in the construction season around here. Uh, the way things worked with uh, um, getting the design started and stuff, we ended up having people out here doing field work in January and the real cold winter a couple years ago. We appreciate that. Um, you know, the timing. The timing. Sure. All those people. Yep, yep. The drone photos have been awesome. I share those around the office. People love seeing those because you know, this project has touched every one of our offices, I think, even Key West. <laughs> and so I send those pictures around when I get them. People love them. I, I, I think, think the only issue you're going to run into, Sam, is that we, we're going to do this presentation and people like the FAA are going to be a little resistant to it because now we've changed the bar a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We have a big crane out there. <laughs> and all kinds of other people are going to think they can do the same thing. Uh, well, that's probably true. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, and I, I do I honestly get that feedback from FAA. Please don't tell anybody, anybody what you do here because we don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, not to <coughs> digest dialogue here or whatever, but the, the airline future really is to downsize the metros and, you know, and make smaller hubs and stuff in the process, whatever, because it's just more and more people are going and the major airports can't handle it. Yeah. And so, yes, sir. I, I guess I'm in agreement with you, Sam. And, and, uh, I mean, we've got we've to look at this closely and make sure that we have our presentation um, that it's maybe not going to offend the FAA <laughs> or, or saying, or, but also, we, this is, we're not done. I mean, for, I mean, we have aspirations of other airlines and things like that coming in now that we have the size of the runway that it can accommodate these planes. So we have to, so we have to make sure we get our message out to those other carriers that they know, hey, they can do this stuff. So you should be on board with them too. So for us, for our airport to be viable and to put more people to work and do more things in this area, we have to make sure we package this correctly but it's going to be very important for us going forward. Yep. And, and believe me, when it's a it's a tight knit industry. Um, when somebody is successful in a place like Ogdensburg, then everybody's going to be paying attention, and they're going to want a piece of that pie. So you got to be prepared for that. I'm, I mean, just like we were saying yesterday in our airport meeting. Hey, we had 27 people working in the terminal at the one time the other day. Yes. So that's showing that what we're trying to do for the North Country of putting people to work and making our, our area better 
um, you know, all the way around. I think that is one of the tasks when we get to the end of the project, too. I mean, you know, I think people will be stunned by the amount of diesel fuel that we have gone through on this project. You know, things like that, the number right. of employees, the amount of economic, you know, the amount of money that it pushes out into the economy all around the airport is right. is impressive. No, and that that's, I guess, in, in packaging our, our uh, uh, story, that's going to be important. Absolutely. Uh, not only for the people locally to know that, but outside to know, hey, they can do this stuff and this is what they've done. Thank you. There's lots of publications, good articles, and um, we yeah. the ribbon cut. But, uh, uh, yeah. We could also send you on tour, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I think you did a great job. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I love it, Doug. I think our Key West office needs a presentation on this. So <laughs> <laughs> I, think should go. Yeah. <laughs> I think you and I should go. <laughs> so, when, uh, when I gave the presentation in Hershey, there was a number of high level FAA people. Why so much interest in what is interesting? And the response to a person was, we were worried about what you were going to say, we wanted to know what you were going to say. So we tried to put the FA in a good light. Because they were, they don't want to do it again, but they were extremely helpful. And They've been great to work with. Yes. This is a scheduled thing that uh, we just talked about. Um, Typically, on a runway, a project program of this magnitude, you're looking at 10 years. If everything goes right, you're looking at, at four to five years. Rarely does everything go right. So that's the normal schedule is on the bottom. So under a normal schedule, where everything went perfectly, you'd be starting final design at about the time the first uh, aircraft takes off um, from this aircraft. The first Airbus takes off from this aircraft in just under two months. Um, it's taken a lot of work. I mean, so that's fundamentally in the voting. Those people at Cape Air have been fantastic in this project. I think you'll see. I think you'll see general stimulation of the here, and so, um, and so that's what Cape Air is obviously going for as well. So you should see people not only interested in going for it, but other places. Oh, absolutely. It, as an example, Plattsburgh also has essentially our service. We're doing about 140, 150,000 people a year. So uh, you can you can accommodate both. Uh, with the provision that essential air service uh, tends to be politically sensitive in Washington, and so you know, the rules could change. This puts a little more detail to the timeline. Uh, one of the reasons we got this done uh, was because things are all out of order, and this is what this is the slide that makes the FAA nervous. Um, because we were into uh, we were into design before we had even forecast approval on the master plan. Normally. You gotta get the forecast before you start.
then we got the uh, then we got the uh, word from Allegiant that they wanted to compress that schedule even more and take an additional 30 days out of that schedule to, as Jeff mentioned, meet the uh, Canadian Thanksgiving as opposed to the uh, Thanksgiving in the U.S. So um, there was that. Also, that schedule compression where we took 30 days out of that schedule, um, the, we did have to um, discuss that with our contractors. There was some additional payment negotiated there because they had to switch to basically working 12-hour days. Um, so uh, we had to pick up some of those additional costs from them in order to meet that schedule. Um, we had. As with every construction project, there are things to deal with along the way, and this is not only just a couple of construction projects, but there are impacts all the way across the airport for this. Um, whether it lost a lot of sleep.
feet by nine feet little triangle, and you can't do it because of that little triangle in the middle. And I was like, really? <laughs> really? Um, and that, that was a great example where the FAA really helped us out because they, they did a modification standard and they, they, yeah. they saw that it didn't make any sense. now for about the last, uh, we're coming up on 40 days, I guess, uh, since the terminal's been shut down. Um, an extraordinary amount of activity right now in that terminal. You'll see everything from open walls to uh, closed walls and painting going on. We'll, we're going to have some people in there installing tile next week, so it's always a good thing when you can start to see some of the finishes actually being, um, being done. Still a long way to go there. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we will have uh, Cape Air utilizing the terminal in about three weeks' time, and uh, you know we need to make sure that TSA is up and running, that they're able to screen bags, that uh, Cape Air is able to do the things that they need to do to um, process passengers as well as luggage. So all of that is going on concurrently right now, and there's so many people in that building that they're kind of tripping over themselves. Uh, so the hold room is basically done. Uh, a lot of finishes going in there right now. Uh, we've got some issues with some, well, some materials. Uh, it'd be nice if we could get some doors. Um, oddly enough, uh, we're having trouble getting doors shipped here on time, but uh, all of that will hopefully come out and wash. Um, I didn't have any gray hairs when I started this project. <laughs> um, the expansion area is uh, basically, could, well, the, the outer shell of the building is up. That will be your um, uh, baggage claim area. Uh, that will be one of the last things that is completed in, um, in September, as that equipment has a long lead time. Uh, Cape Air will have to kind of do things the way they did them before. A lot of hand handling of bags, but uh, then we'll get to the, uh, we'll get that baggage claim belts and stuff installed and one of the last things. Um, so the way you see it, uh, do you see the terminal building being complete?
completely functional by October 1st? Yes. I mean, I know there's going to be maybe some finished work or whatever it want to be, but the, the function of having aircraft come in, whatever, I know it reports to me. Yes, we, the, the, the way the contracts are written, we've got significant liquidated damages in there. We've got a lot of incentives for the um, for the contractors to be completed on time. Obviously, um, you know, we all want to see that happen. Yeah. I think the I, I the way I see it right now, we've stayed on this schedule pretty well. Um, the air side has actually been ahead of schedule for most of the project, and that's somewhat due to the really kind weather we've had this summer as far as construction. It hasn't been kind on your lawns, but it's been pretty good for paving. <laughs> um, so that is, uh, um, that's, that's been to our benefit. Uh, there is a lot of stuff going on in that terminal building that all needs to come together um, over the next 45 days. Uh, we, we don't, I have concerns. Uh, I don't see them coming to fruition where we are. We don't have a fully functional terminal building, but uh, that's the stuff that keeps me awake at night. So uh, making sure that all of that happens. But as I mentioned, the, the baggage handling. gives us a little bit of fluff there. Uh, with even some of the changes that we have, we're projected to
changes that have happened. Um, so with that, we're at about 4.9% of the original bid price. Uh, I will say that this is renovation of an existing building, which is always more difficult than building a brand new building. Uh, you do find things unexpected behind walls, um, above ceilings that uh, you did not realize were there. Uh, same thing with utilities. Uh, you know, we did find that uh, the national grid service was not near as deep as they said it was. Uh, Verizon is requesting a new service, all of those types of things, and, and all of those are included in that 180. The um, airfield negative 312 include the extra cost of having it from what they're uh, That does not include that 170000 That is strictly the, the stuff that's under the grant itself. So okay. The stuff that you had in the So, Bill, is that uh, $3.6 million and the $182,000 hour cost? 100% on us. Yes. Yes. On us. Bill, I, I well, that, that's not entirely correct. There is a three-quarter million dollar uh, Empire State uh, development on the baggage claim grant. You know, I, I, I have a question, and I, when you guys were here the last time I, I addressed it, and you just mentioned that a couple minutes ago, uh, the national grid lines, the lines that weren't deep enough, uh, did, did national grid, did they go out and inspect that? Did, you know.
information. that doesn't get communication to the building and that would impact our schedule and at, at some point you kind of acquiesce to the utilities requirements um, well I guess I'm not I'm just not happy with the situation where as you stated National Grid and the utilities don't come out and check that number one right so then when something happens oh you owe us X amount of dollars God knows what it's going to cost us before that's done and I told somebody messed up someplace, and that's a, that's just my concern. Well, obviously, I mean, and I'm speaking for myself. Obviously, we're in, we were and are under time constraints, and we have to get this work done to make sure we fly. But I would recommend the board explore every option sure. that we have to see if we can recoup some of these costs. I mean, we'll make those decisions down the line. But there, that might be something we definitely have to look at. You know, I mean, we're we're between a rock and a hard place. We all know that. We got to get it done so we yeah. can get planes in the air and people parking. But I, uh, my opinion, this is not a done, no. done deal. I agree with you. So, well, let, let's go back and think about this a little bit. The bid price is three point seven million dollars, whatever. And, and so, realistically, was that a good deal or a bad deal? I mean, did you think it was going to be four point two million? I heard all sorts of money that was going to be whatever. So if it's three point six million dollars, three point seven, and I look at the bid price, okay, of a fluctuation of five percent, it doesn't take long to figure out. You know, there there is your difference of money that you didn't figure out. You, you sure I'm taking this? So well, the flexibility. I, 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 I we don't understand this project. I guess yeah. that's the best way to put it. Yeah, uh, I'll say that. Um, out of that $180,000, uh, probably over half of it is um, requested changes from tenants and from the port of court. Okay. Um, you have requested a lot of changes that get incorporated into the building itself, um, whether they be reallocation of office space or building new walls to uh, uh, incorporate new office space. 
and all of that is included in that hundred and eighty thousand know, dollars. There's about a hundred thousand dollars due to a legion alone. Yeah. Due to a legion alone, there's about a hundred thousand dollars. Yes, in that and that's good to know. I mean, for new board members, it's good to know exactly the frustrations of things both ways, whatever. I, I want to do say this, okay, with the contractors, everybody involved in this process, everybody's been very upfront about everything we're doing, how it's going about. I mean, we have construction meetings here. Everybody knows everything that's going on. is very well communicated, and everybody knows exactly how this is going about. I, obviously, with a, a one-time shot at a project, I mean, there's, there's things that are going to... I'm not trying to make excuses, but... No. Uh, and I will say, I will say also, you know, if it's over a hundred thousand dollars in requested changes, sure. um, of which zero of that is um, an MJ fee, we have incorporated all of those changes into the design and into the construction project without requesting an additional dime. And uh, I, 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 not that I, I want to gloat or anything, but I think that also needs to be recognized. And, and I, I appreciate that, though, and, I, and I'm not saying, hey, I'm very happy with where, we're, where we are and where we're going. I just think that there's, I mean, I'm not blaming it on you guys or anybody in particular, but we just have to take a look at that and say, hey, you know, um, it might be something we say, okay, we can live with that. But I don't I don't disagree that um, there may be an opportunity to go back to both Verizon and National exactly. Grid and say, you know, we put in a three... You, we put in a three-inch spare conduit at your cost, right. um, thinking of future expansion. Right. Well, Verizon came along and decided they were going to occupy that with their new service, even though their existing service works fine. Right. Um, so there's some benefit to them. They're going to. It sounds to me like they're going to pull some fiber into the building now, and you know, it, they're, they're trying to expand their service to the tenants that are there right. because it will benefit them. And 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 that's exactly that's what I'm, I'm my that's was my what I was trying yes. to express. Yes. Like, hey, we're we're happy to have some skin in the game of that, yeah. but you know, there's some benefit to you guys too. Yes. Yes. So let's let's see if we can just talk about this. Yes, and um, um, unfortunately. I don't have the time right now. No, I know. Like I, no, I, I need to and, get and, the and rise. I, and I appreciate and, it. We and, need to get and, it done. And I need to get power and communications into that building in the next right, right. couple of weeks. Yeah. Can, can I add one more thing on the, on the, uh, the national grid thing? If we had spent the twenty or thirty or forty thousand dollars to locate that line during the design process, you were going to pay for relocating it because there's no way to avoid it. It's not like it was something that could have been avoided. Right. It, it had to get. It, it was always in the project. We just didn't know about it until you know we didn't know the details of that until. The bulldozer started running, but if it had been known by the through the ground penning earth and trading radar, it was going to be in the bid and it was going to increase the bid prices by you know whatever amount. So, uh, can we pay for it once or twice? Pay for what? Well, not now it's on a new alignment, so the thought was it would stay where it was. Okay, so we're really just changing. Okay, yeah, yeah. I didn't know if we paid for the first one no. and no. then we moved it again, so no. we just paid for it. Once. Right, okay. Uh, well, no, I had Sam mentions or asked the question about the 3.6 million being on our dime. Also, Sam, the parking is. So we look at it differently here. We combine the parking with the terminal. It's combined that way because that's the way it's been. Uh, Marcy got the bid to do the top part and then the others were, uh, others received that. But when we look at it, we add the parking with the terminal uh, because that's all of us. So we're looking at over four million dollars. We're looking Five. at uh, close to six. Close to six. Close to six. But if you add those two together, you'll get five. Uh, yeah, there are things that I don't have in, in, that we don't have in our contract. You know, the GSE right. building itself. I added the site work in there just to try and keep everything. Right. Let's go back uh, to what Gavin said. Apply is as we move forward with this, do we now have room for expansion uh, for Verizon and National Grid that I'm not going to have to go back in a year or two and we do another modification? Um, well, you will have new services into that building that do have capacity in them, yes. Um, whether or not you know you increase the power, you double the power requirements, you probably need another. There's room for expansion right now. Um, although
and hopefully there'll be enough expansion uh, or need for expansion that within the next five years uh, we have enough revenue that we can do right. something. Yes. Yeah. Th th at this point, you need to get an airline in there. You right. need to sell them fuel. Probably three, three loaded dump trucks <laughs> sitting in the parking lot, all coming in to get a cup of coffee, and they were talking about the fact that they had sold out of diesel fuel again. Um, so, uh, you know, there's there's quite an impact there. So. I think you'll notice it when the construction stops. Yeah, we have maxed out that asphalt plant for most yeah. of the summer. <laughs> um, they, we actually had to stop paving for a week because. Um, they couldn't get all their other projects done. Um, and Hansen owns the plant, so they, Hansen had to get a few projects done, and quite frankly, they had to rebuild stockpiles and uh, get in new shipments of asphalt and just to be able to make the final push here over the next 40 days. And they shut down some local guys because of, you know, driveways and stuff because of the <laughs> yeah, you know, so. so we gave them a week to do all the driveways and parking lots and the highways that they could get done, and then we wanted the plant back. So. <laughs> But, but that is so important to yeah. our story, folks. Yes. I mean, yes. It's so, so important to our story. And I think those are all the numbers that kind of when we get said and done here, we need to sit down and, and really put the fine print of that story. And uh, That's part of the story. We need to be able to tell that we had 5,000 trucks come out of the local quarry, 3,000 trucks of asphalt uh, coming to the, uh, the airfield. Some of the laborers work with people as well. One of our inspectors is a local person. So. And I love the fact that this, every photo we take, um, this board that s sits in the corner over here is completely obsolete. Every week we take photos, and the next week those photos are obsolete. Things are getting done so quickly out there. So, great story. And we're extremely proud to have been a part of it. I learned a, a new term called Aeronopolis from the words 
We'll start with the airport. What's what, what goals when you can see comforts around it? Yeah. Certain things that come up, and it's like when you start looking at it, wow, it's a, it does grow itself out. Mm -hmm. it's out. I, I have one more concern. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not nitpicking, but no, that's all right. <laughs> but you know, I was it's shown that last night I took a ride, I looked at the uh, the parking lot, the striping on the parking lot. Every line has a little stripe. Your, your first look at it is, wait a minute, is there anything? No, I get out and it looked like there was like a fine sand. That's it. the glass beads that they spray. So that'll, will that wash away? Will Some that, of those beads will dissipate. Anything that's not embedded in the paint will, yeah. will dissipate. Yeah. Because it, you know, it just every every line's got overspray out of it. When I saw the picture, honestly. Uh, I thought, man, they must have been drunk when they did that. <laughs> <laughs> but when you go look at it, you can see it's just where they put the glass. glass okay. So All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we will move that one light. <laughs> <laughs> you don't realize where the lights are until somebody paints a line. And, and it's all just kind of ambiguous survey information. And on a related issue to the parking lot, uh, had extensive discussions with MAPCO, had extensive discussions with ATI last night. I have uh, discussions with McFarland and Marcy in the field today. I think we've got a workaround on the uh, entry and exit plazas where we do not have to rip those out at a cost of you know, anywhere from twenty-five to $50,000. So Good. I think we've got uh, fairly confident now we've got a solution. Yeah. Good. That's good news. Keep checking off the issues one at a time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We're in the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> We're way <white> out. We're in the tunnel. Late of October fifth is getting pretty big, though. <laughs> yes. You know, it's interesting the dynamics of, of people envision this. Whatever we started three and a half years ago, and we started seeing uh, lots of time, lots of time, and, and it's all of a sudden at the end. I mean, this is it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary to think about all the things that we visualize, but you realize how much time it really takes to. I, I never once thought there was lots of time. Anything else for Bill? Jeff? Yeah.